that's better. That's better. All righty, y'all, come on back. Come on back. Come on back. Come on back. Awesome. Yes, much better. I apologize for that. I don't know what happened. This time it wouldn't it wouldn't turn. So, anyway, we are good. Amen. Let's get started. We lost a few minutes. <laughs> we lost a few minutes. Amen. Well, let's get started. Father, we bless you, God, and we thank you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this night, the opportunity, Lord, to come together and to study your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you are God all by yourself, Lord. And I thank you as we lean in, God, we can know your mind. Lord, we 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 quote that, that word that says, that scripture that says, um, that um, no one knows your thoughts, God, but I, I know from experience, Lord, I can learn your thoughts. I can lean in and know your mind, God. So I just thank you that tonight we lean in, God, to know the heart of God, to know the thoughts of God, to have the mind of Christ so that we would be able to live a life that glorifies you and honors you, God. We thank you for that. Even in the midst, God, of um, the pandemic and social, um, civil unrest, God, and, and a government, God, that it's hard to understand, God. I thank you, Lord, that we have a government that is not shaken. We have a government that understands what is happening with this civil unrest. We have a government that understands the pandemic and can keep us safe, can hide us in the cleft of the rock, God, and we just thank you for that tonight. We celebrate you, God. We come to eat at your table, Lord. Your word says, God, that the crumbs from the table are enough to heal us. Woo! So, God, we thank you, Lord. If all we get is a crumb, God, we receive our healing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you for that, God. We thank you, Lord God, that you made a seat for us, God, that you made a seat. You made a, a table in the presence of our enemies, God, Lord, that we could sup with you, God, that we could eat with you, God, that we could eat upon your word, God, that we could grow. We could be changed, Lord, in a moment, in an instant, God. We thank you for it, Lord, and we honor you tonight, God. Speak through me, God, I pray. Holy Spirit, Speak through me, speak through me. I speak that every hindrance, every interference, every frequency interference in the name of Jesus is, is cleared in the name of Jesus and that the frequency of heaven is in tune with me, God. I thank you for that, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Whoop, whoop. Hey, y'all. Awesome. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We are actually going to pick up where we were last week. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited. I didn't see any questions from last week, so I guess we're good. If you have any, please um, text them in, and I will, um, I'll, I'll try to keep my eye on the scroll, and we'll address those questions. Amen. Hey, LaVoy, I see you. Whoop, whoop. All right. Awesome. Well, hey, Pastor Hasker Hutchins. Hey, Joel. Joe, Joe, Big Joe. Jasmine, whoop, whoop. Elanda, yes. Awesome. How awesome. It's so great to see. Hey, Daisy. I was just thinking about you. How sweet. It's awesome to see everybody. Hungry for the word, right? Mm. Hey, Chris. <laughs> I love that emoji. Hey, Chris. I love it. Y'all, I love y'all. I love y'all. The equipping center. My Lord, nothing like it. Nothing like it in all the earth. In all the earth. So, hey, Roz, I see you. Amen. So, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And again, it's always wise to set the stage. 
to set the stage and let um, give yourself a context so that you know what you're working. Hey, Ken Daisy. Um, give yourself a context so that you know what you're working with. We love you too. I love you. Woo. Um, I love you, E. Um, get me all misty. Um, so, yes, we're looking at the context of the Corinthian church. And in this case, mm, the Corinthian church was birthed whew, in the midst of, of, of just turmoil. Oh, my gosh. Um, Paul's letter to them, and I don't know if we'll go straight through the book of 1 Corinthians, but Paul's letter to them addresses eight separate problems. These people had the same issues that we see today in the earth. Um, and they even had this high place where they had a, a, a worship, worship um, altar established for a pagan deity of love. And these ladies, these goddesses, um, would keep it during the, um, the day. And at night, they would come out and come down into the city and they would sell themselves for for sexual pleasures um, and so they really had a lot of issues they had a lot of money they had a lot of wealth and yes those two are separate um, they had a lot of access and they without God they were running um, according to the lust of their own desires. So they, Paul was dealing with eight separate things when he got there. First of all, there was a sectarian spirit. Remember, that was the last week we talked about sectarianism is when um, a group breaks off of a group and they have this amplified view um, that's different from what they came out of. So we normally see that in politics um, in philosophy, and we see it in religion. And for us, quite honestly, it would be denominations. It would be those breaking off of denominational thoughts and what what's required to get to heaven, what's not required to get to heaven. You know, one of the things that um, I deal with a lot and, and as often as I can is people saying that Salvation requires more than Romans 10, 9, 10, and it does not. But you do want to grow in the Lord and walk with him. You do want to grow in your um, desire to please him. But doing it out of your behavior is temporary. And we'll talk about that. It's temporary. But doing it out of your love for him as the spirit of God changes you allows it to be permanent. For example, um, some might say some sex, some denominational sex might say um, that you can't go to heaven if you, if you smoke and drink. Now, it's not a great idea to be a drunk and to cloud your, your lungs up, right? So if I've, anybody out there is dealing with that, um, I encourage you to um, lean into God for strength. Um, to be free of that. But it's not a determinant to keep you out of heaven. If you submit it to God, he can give you the strength to overcome it and you'll have a healthier and happier life. So it's not, it's not a, a door lock, you know? Salvation is purely Romans 10, 9, 10. So sectarianism, a sectarian spirit it is a smaller group that breaks off and amplifies things and has rules and things that, that God didn't require. Um, the second thing that Paul dealt with was sexual immorality. The third thing was marriage and divorce, um, which also included incest. They, he also dealt with eating foods offered to idols. He also dealt with um, the wearing of the veil he also dealt with the Lord's Supper, with spiritual gifts, and the resurrection of the body. 
All of those things are important. Hey, Naisha. All of those things are important. So when Paul comes to Corinth, when he comes to the city of Corinth, they are wide open and he begins to preach the gospel. And I love it because the gospel is the only thing that has the power to change our lives. The gospel is the only thing that has the power to change our nature because the word of God says that when we become um, saved, we become a new creation. All old things are passed away. Now, you might still feel like doing all of those things, but we know that they're passed away. How do we know that? Our basic thing. Those from TEC, you will know this. Our three parts are at work. We are a spirit. This might be backwards for you guys. We are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. So, sorry if that's backwards. Um, we have a spirit, I mean, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. That means that when God works with us, he works in our spirit. That means he makes us brand new. That means that when he works with our spirit, with those external issues, our flesh is going to follow our spirit or our soul, one or the other. It's going to decide by whichever one is strongest. So if our spirit is leading our lives, our flesh is going to agree. If our soul, our mind, will, and our emotions, if we choose our will over God's will, if we choose our emotions over the peace of God, then our body is going to follow our soul and we're going to be a train wreck. So when we become born again, God renews our spirit connection. He renews that and he makes us brand new. Ooh, just like in the garden. So they were dealing with these issues and Paul began to preach the gospel and the gospel began to speak to the core of those people and they were born again. Oh, so beautiful. He turned their lives around. Cor Corinth was a, a real capital of sin. So let's go to our word. We started, we started at the very beginning. Now I'm just gonna give a recap so that we can keep moving. So it's written by the Apostle Paul and it's to the church of God at Corinth. And Corinth actually means satiated. It means um, satisfied in the appetite. And of course the appetite in this case was not a good one. So Paul was coming to deal with their appetite. And they had begun to have division. And we begin to see that in verse 10. But before then, the beautiful thing is Paul was reminding them of who they were because he planted this church. And we see that in Acts chapter 18. But Paul planted this church. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paul planted this church and when he did later on, he heard that there was some problems. So he made it back to them to deal with it. He knew that if they lost what they'd had, that it would be difficult for them to come back again. And so it says in verse four, he says, I thank my God always concerning you, number one, for the grace of God, which was given to you. Oh my gosh. They were given the grace of God by Christ Jesus. Number two, that you were enriched in everything by him. So they had grace and then they were enriched in everything. 
And then the third thing, he said, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. To have that confirmed in you means to have it established. The testimony, the witness of Christ was established in them. Woo. He says, so that you come short and no gift. So that you come short and no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also establish you again in the end. That you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is so good because they were coming out of a pagan society. And so he, he said that as they were established, that they would be blameless in the end. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whew. One second. Okay, sorry about that. So that they would be blameless in the end. Then verse 9 is key for us. It says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. God is faithful. He is, he is true to his word. And he called them into the oneness. Remember, fellowship means communion and oneness called him into the oneness of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, one thing, one thing. And that there be no divisions among you. So they had begun to have division in their beliefs, although they had been called to a fellowship. And he said, this is not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. That is the key in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. The key is the cross of Christ. And so as we see in verse 12, he says, now I heard that there were these issues. He says, and... Some are saying, I am of Paul. Some are saying, I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. Or I am of Christ. He says, is Christ divided? <clears throat> I'm sorry, y'all. I don't understand what's happening with my throat. I didn't, bring a, I didn't bring any water with me today. I'm sorry. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? He says, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's saying, look, this is not about Cephas or Apollos or Paul. He says, this is about the cross. As we look at verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, <clears throat> my goodness. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Then we went through and saw what he was saying about the wisdom of God, that the wisdom of God is, is stronger, that the weakness of God is stronger than men. Powerful. So we take up our part two at verse 26. He says, for you see your calling brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty and not many noble are called. But God who has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world 
to put the shame the things that are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. Let's break that down. He makes a stronger case for the cross as he goes on. When he says that God has chosen the foolish things, that's the godless things. The people were not following God. In fact, one, one translation says blockheads, that he has taken the absurd things of the world to dishonor the wise, those that counted on their own wisdom and philosophy and their own thoughts and their wise words. He said he's called those things foolish and he's taken those things, the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, to take those people that they knew their story, they knew their background, they knew what they had been doing and use those lives, not many noble, not many mighty. He used the people that seem to be less esteemed and used them to show those that thought they were high in esteem that he could do something with their lives. The weak things, the strengthless, the feeble things of the world to put to shame the mighty things. This was very interesting. The mighty things, listen to this, the mighty, one who has strength of soul, strength of soul to sustain attacks of Satan, strong, strong, and therefore exhibiting many excellences. What does that mean? He said he took the weak things of the world to put to shame those who had enough strong um, strength in their souls, in their behavior, to appear mighty and appear strong. Remember, we don't live in our soul. If we live in our soul, we'll make a mess of our lives. We want to live in our spirit where we commune with God and we can have the mind of God, that we can know the thoughts of God, that we can be led by God. So, <clears throat> Those, he said, there are even those that have strength of soul to sustain. That's wild. There are some people that are strong enough in their soul to sustain the attacks of Satan. It's crazy. But it doesn't say that they, 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 they win, that they outlast him. Because that's behavioral. He says, and also the base things, the ignoble things. These are even things, people that have no family, people that were disowned, people that couldn't trace their lineage, which in that time was a stain. He said, even the, the base things and the things that are despised, no esteem, thought of to be very low, he said, he even chooses those to bring to nothing, to render inactive and inoperable the things that are the establishment, the systems that are active at that time. So what does that mean for us? It means that it doesn't matter how the world sees you. It doesn't matter if you, if you don't know your lineage. It doesn't matter if you are feeling strengthless or feeble that God uses, that's the perfect candidate. You are the perfect candidate for God to raise up. If you feel like you don't qualify, you're the perfect person for God to raise up. The entire city of Corinth was full of sin. They were rich, they were wealthy, and they were doing whatever they wanted to do. And God went in with Paul and raised up the Corinthian church. And he began to establish the will of God in that city that no flesh, the word says in chapter in verse 29. Why did he use them? Number one, to confound the wise. 
all of the Greek philosophers, all of the, the, um, the Jewish theologians, all of them that were counting on their wisdom of words, God used those that were base. God used those that were looked down upon. God used those that didn't really know what their last name was. God used those that felt helpless and feeble. God used those that felt strengthless in their society. God used those that felt like they were trapped in the, in the, the appetites of, of Corinth. He used those to bring to shame, to bring to dishonor those that counted on their own wisdom. And why did he do that? Number one, to show them that these lives mattered, that these lives meant something. And the second reason was that no flesh should glory in his presence, that no flesh, no carnal thing, this is actually our flesh, our body, that no flesh should glory, boast in his presence. So when I started to look up this part, oh my goodness, this glory, that no flesh should glory. This has two levels. It means that no flesh, no person should boast in his presence because everything that's happening for us comes through him. But then the second level was to pray to God. So there's, there's the Greek word, kokeomai, and then the second word was eukomai. The first level is that no, no flesh should boast in his presence. And the second one was that no flesh should pray to God in his presence. Oh my gosh. Y'all, do you hear that? That's amazing. He says, don't come to me in the flesh. Oh my gosh. That was huge. That no flesh should boast in his presence and no flesh should pray to him in his presence. Hey, Camille. Mwah! Oh my goodness. That's amazing. So he's saying to us today, and we learned this through the Corinthian church. Don't come to him in the flesh. Commune with him spirit to spirit. That no flesh, no carnal thing. This is carnal. Our flesh is carnal, is decaying every day. So he says, no flesh should boast in my presence because I brought you out of darkness into the marvelous light. You didn't walk out by yourself. You didn't overcome your struggles by yourself. You only came out because of me. No man can come to the father, right? Lest the spirit draw him. So he says, don't glory, don't boast in my presence. He says in today's vernacular is rude. It's rude for you to take credit for what I did. <laughs> the second thing is don't, don't, um, that no flesh. The second level was eukamai to pray to God. No flesh should pray to God in his presence. My God. I can't go to God fleshly. And people have been taught that they can go to God just however they want and talk to God however they want. And their prayers sound more like barking orders than it does honoring him and reverencing him and understanding that if he doesn't put breath in your body, that there is no breath in your body. And they go to God and they say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, do this, 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 and this right now. My God, who, who are you? We are not to come to God and tell him what to do. We are not to come to God and order him around. He is not our errand boy. He's not our butler. God is God. And we come to him. The word shows us right here that we come to him 
in our spirit. And we commune to him spirit and spirit. What did he tell us? He said, God is spirit. I am spirit. And those that worship me must do what? Worship what? Not in the body. We don't worship him in our soul. He says, must worship me in the spirit. Spirit communing with spirit. It's powerful. It's powerful. If I know that when I come to God, I can't come to him in my carnal nature. I can't come to him boasting about, God, I did that. Woo, woo, look what I did. No, you didn't. It's only by his grace that we are able to walk and live this, this life of salvation. So then he goes on. This is so beautiful in verse 30, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. says. So he finishes saying that he's taken the foolish things and the weak things and the base things and the things that are despised. And the things that are not, he has put them to shame. He's put them to shame so that no flesh could glory, could boast, could pray to him in his presence. Then he says, but of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written, he who, glo he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. But of him, and I wrote in my Bible, not ourselves. I'm not in Christ Jesus because of myself. I am in Christ Jesus because of the cross. Remember verse 17 who became for us wisdom from God. He became God's wisdom for us so that as we see him in the word, we have an example of how we're to live our lives. As we see him, we have an example of how to um, treat one another. As we see him, we understand that, with the, that the same spirit that raised him up from the dead lives in us and therefore greater work shall we do. All that he has done, we're able to do. He didn't do it because he was Jesus. He did it because the Lord told him to. And God has grafted us in. And the Father is telling us to imitate Jesus, to do what he did. Because the same spirit lives in us and quickens our mortal bodies. But he says, the wisdom is from God. And righteousness, righteousness, righteousness is not in my behavior, righteousness was a gift from God. He gave it to us. It's not found in my long skirt or in my high neck or covering my elbows or my arms, my shoulders, not wearing makeup. My righteousness is not found in that. My righteousness is found in my gift of salvation. God gave it to us. And so therefore, as I walk with him, righteousness rises up in me. Righteousness is a product. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Righteousness is a product of my love walk with Jesus. Right? The more I love him, the more I want to be in right standing. The more I submit myself, I want to be in right standing with him. It's not a matter of the do's and don'ts. If I love him, my do's and don'ts will line up. And sanctification, being set apart, being set apart, being in, um, somebody that God can use. The word says his eyes go to and fro throughout the earth, looking for someone in whom he can show himself strong. We want to be that person. And then in redemption, that he has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He has redeemed us from the world. He's redeemed, of, redeemed us from the penalty of sin, which we earned. When we were sons of disobedience, we earned it and he redeemed us from it. He says, now, because of this, verse 31, as it is written, he who glories, he who boasts, 
He who prays to God, let him boast and pray to God in the Lord. In your relationship with God, in your relationship with Christ, when you come into the presence of God, he said, boast about me. Boast what God has done. Oh my gosh. Remember that this walk that we're walking is fueled by love, is fueled by faith, is fueled by the complete work of the cross. If there was no cross, there would be no, no um, salvation. If there was no sacrifice, Jesus became that sacrifice for us so that we can walk in this. The word says he is the first fruits. And then we came after. Then it says in chapter two, verse one, and I, brethren, when I came to you, this is what Paul is saying. When I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. Again, he's going back to um, worldly wisdom, um, wisdom that we get from thinking on our own and not communing with God. He said, I didn't come to you with excellence of speech or wisdom, any mysteries, all this philosophizing. He said, um, declaring to you the witness of God, the testimony of God. He said, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. My God, that's the key. If we remember the cross, we can walk this thing out. I was saying earlier today to someone that if we're saved, and we are, that's not a question. It's just setting the, the foundation. If we are saved and we know we're saved, then we also should know that we are healed. If we are saved, then we also should know that God has given us the victory. If we are saved and we know that we're saved, so when we walk through this process of salvation, we know that we get saved. We know that we give our hearts to the Lord. We know that we confess him as Lord. And we know that we believe that he raised him on the third day. If we know that, then we know everything else he said we can have, we have. And in that is salvation every day. Not just on Sunday. It's Monday through Saturday. We can walk it out, y'all. We don't have to bow to the ways of the world. We don't have to do what the world does, especially now. We don't have to be um, destructive with our walk. We can walk this thing out, praying and letting God know, not being anxious, but prayers of, <clears throat> excuse me, prayers of supplication to him. He said, be anxious for nothing. But in all things, by prayer and supplication, let me know what's going on in your heart. <clears throat> let me know what's going on with you. Talk to me. Don't go out and BS the world. Come and talk to me. Because of the cross, we have access to that. Paul says in verse 3 of chapter 2, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. He says, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, right? But in the power of God, my God, he said, I came to you in, in weakness, in a low place, not so that you would see me as weak, but that you would understand this is not happening by my wisdom. This is happening by the spirit of God in me, that when I am weak, 
in him I am strong. And the word says it came in demonstration that their faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The wisdom of men versus the power of God. Now, there's a lot of people that are, are preaching the wisdom of men without power. But when the word of God goes forth, it should create something fresh, something new in, within us. There should be a shift, a, tur a, a turning on of, of wisdom or a turning off of ways that we've been trying to part from. That's what the word says, that it's in, pers it's in demonstration of the spirit and with power. Then he says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, not, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, my goodness, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, here we go, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Here we are, back to the cross. They thought they understood what was going on and they didn't realize that when they killed Jesus, which actually they did not do, they put him on the cross, but he told us, no one takes my life. They're just following the script. They're just following what's supposed to happen so that the second man, Adam, the first man, Adam, ruined it so that the second man, Adam, could put us back together again, could reconcile us back to God. Everything comes out of the cross. The cross is everything. What Jesus did on that cross and how long he hung on that cross was not just a, um, a happenstance. It was by design. If they had known, if hell had known, if the rulers, this, the word says rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, by the way, if they had known what they were doing, they would have never allowed the cross to happen. But now that it did, my God, if you do nothing else in your life, understand the cross. Understand the power of the cross and what it does for you, what it does for me what it does for those that are broken, those that are feeble, those that are without a lineage, those that might not know their family, don't know their daddies, don't know their moms. The word says those that are absurd and godless, blockheads, the cross is for them as well. We all fall somewhere in there. There was a point in our lives where we were godless. There was a point in our lives when we were absurd, when we were blockheads and made bad decisions. There's a time in our lives where we were less esteemed, where people didn't understand us. A time when we, when we felt like nothing. He said, but he gave us the cross so that number one, we knew we would know that we were not doing this of ourselves. It is a gift, but also Man, that the glory of God would rest on our lives, not in our flesh, but as we commune with the Lord. As we commune with the Lord, spirit to spirit, his spirit begins to rest upon us and we're able to do what he did. <clears throat> Excuse me. So verse eight says, had they known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for him, for those who love him. You have no clue the awesome and wonderful things that God has in front of you. This is what it tells us. 
Eye has not seen it, ear has not heard it, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Woo, birthday every day, right? Christmas every day, celebrations every day. He is an Ephesians 3.20 God. No matter what we can ask or think, no, our greatest thing that we could try to imagine, the word says that he goes beyond that. Why? Because we love him and he loves us. He first loved us and so we love him. And in that relationship, my, in that relationship, yes, Colette, in that relationship, there is greatness. My Lord, there is fullness of joy. There is strength in weakness. There's so much. There's so much. There is understanding where, where there was confusion. There's an exchange that's happening every day. I want to take this off. There's an exchange that's happening every day as we walk with him. When we get up in the morning and to hear him say, good morning. When we go out and we hear him say, I love you. When we see him give us the desires of our hearts. When we go into a meeting and we think it's going to go left and it goes right. Man, when we're dreading making a phone call and we make that phone call and God has already softened the heart on the other side. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. We can't figure them out. We can't figure them out. But this is the key. Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. I love it. How do we commune with him? Spirit to spirit. Remember, this is our flesh. He says that nobody should um, no flesh should glory, even pray to him in his presence. Mm. Amen, Dominique. Great to see you. But God has revealed them. So if I want to know what God sees, if I want to know what God hears, if I want to know what God has prepared, all I need to do is commune with him in the spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Oh, I love it. The deep things of God. If I want to know the deep things of God, I need to come out, go into that place where it's just me and him. Shut out the world. Shut out the sounds, the cares the struggles, my days, the frustrations, disappointments, confusions, shut it out and get quiet before God and begin. One thing that I do, I take, this might sound weird, but it might help you. I take my focus from my brain, like when I'm thinking, and I pull it down to my heart. Now, I can't tell you how I do it, but I do. I take that focus and I put it in my heart. Like right now, I just went there. And it's a place where I can hear God. Mm hmm. Y'all, train yourself to take that journey from your head to your heart. And all it is is shifting your focus from your thinking which is human to your spirit. Just, just transfer your focus. Yeah. Practice that. You'll begin to hear him so quickly, so quickly. It says, for the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man, here we are. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. It's in me. My spirit is in me. As a born-again believer, 
the Holy Spirit of God now lives in me. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit searches, can, the Spirit can search me, can, can commune with me, and reveal the heart of God to me. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Again, how do I find out the things of God? I got to commune with the spirit. Yes, Chris, you got to shut out all the noise of the flesh. Shift, make that, make that journey. What is that? 18 inches, make that journey. <clears throat> so that you can commune with the spirit. Your spirit can commune with the spirit of God. Verse 12 says, now we have received not the spirit of the world. Hey, thank you, Lord. But the spirit who is from God. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Again, if we want to know what's going on, we got to know God. Amen, Nina. Okay, I just see what time it is. 7.56, we're doing good. So we have, it's, um, verse 12, now we have received. I want to stop right there. Thank you, Lord. We have received. We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Hmm. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches. Again, the spirit of wisdom versus the wisdom of man. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Yes! Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I love it. I love it. The Holy Spirit teaches us. The things that we speak are not in, in human wisdom, but what the Holy Spirit teaches us, comparing spiritual to spiritual. We cannot do spiritual and carnal and get understanding. Spirit and spirit. Then it says, um, verse 14, but the natural man, here we are, our flesh, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Remember what we said earlier? God takes the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. He takes the weak things of the world to put to shame the mighty and the base and despised and things that are not to bring to nothing those that are. If we are gonna learn from God and commune with him and live out this spirit life that we can live out, we are going to have to do it in our spirit. Remember, spirit, soul, and body. That is the only way that we are going to walk it out. And there are things, I would say that there are our natural man, we know, we know what's there, right? I know what my struggles are, you know what your struggles are. So as we commune with him spirit to spirit, the Holy Spirit teaches us how to have victory over those struggles. Hey, Leon, hey, Bobby. Um, gives us, the Spirit, Holy Spirit teaches us, teaches us how to walk by the Spirit so that we can overcome those things. We can overcome the things that try to ensnare us and trap us and cause us to walk in our flesh. Then verse 15, oh my gosh. Well, let me, let me hit one other thing on 14. It says the reason why we can't know them is because they're spiritually discerned. You can't think and understand the spirit. That is why you have to make that journey from your head down to your heart. 
so that all the stuff that you're thinking can get out of the way and your spirit can, can teach you. We can hear what the spirit is saying in our hearts, not our heads. If we try to think our way through it, we will miss God. How do I know that? Because the word says it's not carnally, um, it's not carnally discerned, but is spiritually discerned. Verse 15, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Oh my goodness. That's the end of chapter two. It's a good place to stop. The natural man is devoid of the spirit. And because he's devoid of the spirit, he has no appreciation for things of the spirit. He has no, our natural man has no appreciation for the things of the spirit. Why? Number one, he doesn't understand them. And number two, they are counter to what he desires. Our natural man desires things that are not of God. And that is why the Holy Spirit talks to our spirit and teaches us so that we can become stronger. We can be more like him. If we have a difficulty, what is the spirit saying about that difficulty? Take a minute and find out. Take a minute and make that journey from your head to your heart. God, what are you saying about this difficulty? Because if you try to think it out, you're going to miss God and you're going to mess it up. If I try to think it out, I'm going to do the same. We can't think out the things of God. If we want to have wisdom beyond our own personal knowledge, we have to go to God. Because why? He knows all things. He knows all things. He is everywhere. He is everywhere. But the word says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Who is going to instruct God, he's saying. Right? We can't be judged because if we're following Christ, no one can judge Christ. No one can judge Christ. So if we are walking spirit to spirit and we're allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us, and we're discerning what the spirit is saying and doing, then it is a life according to the spirit of the Lord. And the word says, who can judge that? But we have the mind of Christ. Hey, Charlene, we have the mind of Christ. Oh my gosh, that's a good place to stop. Corinthians, take, take your time to take a look at it. First Corinthians. It's wonderful. This again was a people that were in grave need of God, just like we were. And Paul is going through and reestablishing because they had begun to let other thoughts get in. Other thoughts began to come in and begin to shape their thinking away from God, away from their giftings, away from um, the oneness and the communion that he left them with in Christ. And then he came back and began to relay this. So between now and next Wednesday, let's, let's go back through this and think about the cross. Without the cross, nothing else matters. Think about Christ crucified. Without Christ crucified, nothing else matters. Without Christ's resurrection from the dead, there is no gospel. This is what the word tells us. So as we, we look, he keeps pointing them back to the cross, pointing them, pointing them back to Christ crucified and what that gave us. Yes, Christ crucified gives us access to the mind of Christ. How do I get it? I have to choose my spirit. I have to choose to be spirit-led 
and not soul led, not my will, my mind, my emotions, my think, my do, my feel. I have to choose my spirit and I have to be able to, to catch myself. There's this thing that people say sometimes that um, they say, um, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm getting a message. They say things like, um, you, can, you can do it and then ask for forgiveness later. Y'all, don't do that. Don't do that because you know in your heart, if you think you have to apologize for it later, it's not something you need to do. Get permission. And if you get permission, then praise God. But if you ask and don't get permission, then don't do it. But don't, don't say, um, I can apologize um, if I don't get permission. Don't, don't do that. That's, that's not good. It is a choice. Yes, it is a choice. Amen. Thank y'all. I love y'all. I love y'all. It's so awesome to study the word together. Oh my gosh. I wish I had some kind of a talk back feedback thing. This is amazing. So I would like to give you a couple of announcements. Um, we are driving all the month of June. It was amazing this past Sunday. We had a family forum. And the reason we had it is because of all the stuff that's going on in the world. There's so much going on. And in individual houses, I would hope that we're sitting down and talking with our families. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, TEC as a family, we sat around the kitchen table on Sunday. We had a drive-in service. We had a forum. And we talked about what it looks like to maintain our kingdom identity in the midst of civil unrest. How do we begin that road to recovery? How do we maintain our kingdom identity when we are raging inside, when we are flat out angry? I think we talked about it tonight. It's communing with God spirit to spirit not allowing that rage to take over our, our, our lives. The Bible says our lives are not our own. So if my life is not my own and I, I, I get in a rage about everything that's happening, I have to talk to the one who owns my life. God, help me. Help me deal with these emotions. Help me deal with these, these feelings. And Lord, please give me wisdom for how to move forward in such a time as this. He has all the answers. So I wanna um, invite you all out. Um, I think we're gonna have a part two this Sunday um, at our drive-in service. So we will continue that talk. And then the fourth Sunday of the month, we're gonna have a drive-in service at our Spartanburg location. Yes! So um, keep um, an eye on this page the equipping center page for the announcements and you'll see all the details there. I don't have any times right now, but fourth Sunday in Spartanburg. And then we have Father's Day this month. So keep your pastors in mind and your your male pastors in mind and show them show them your love and appreciation. Amen. And then the last thing we have tonight is being able to worship in our giving. If you are um, on push pay, you know what to do. If you're not on push pay, then um, you can be by down by texting equipping app to 77977. That's E Q U I P P I N G A P P to 77977. You'll get a link and you'll be able to download TEC's personal app where you can keep up with announcements, old sermons. You can send in prayer requests. So much you can do with push pay. Oh my goodness. You're going to really enjoy it. If you want to just go straight to the giving page, you can text TECG 
to 77977 and the giving page will pop up. But I do hope that you would download the app because it is awesome. And we're going to start pushing a lot of information through that app. Hey, Nancy, I miss you too. I love you too. Amen. So that is where we are tonight. I'm so excited. Um, we've, we're in our third chapter of First Corinthians. That's where we'll pick up next week. And you guys take a look. Um, and if you have any questions, please, please, please send them in. Hey, Tito. Woohoo! <laughs> Great to see you. Tell your beautiful bride I said hello. All righty. That is it, you guys. I have enjoyed it. I love you. And um, be sure you get your questions together. And we will move into chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians next week. Alrighty. I love you.